Good morning, all. Uh, welcome to the Universalist Unitarian Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Lake County. Thank you for your patience. Uh, I'm Alexandra, your service leader for today, and my pronouns are she and her. I'm joined by Terry Sullivan at the piano, which was lovely. Um, our speaker today is Reverend Cynthia Snavely, and uh, we thank Betsy and Henry and Dustin for our technical and AC, AV support today. Uh, first, I have a couple of announcements. So um, let me remind you to uh, please mute your cell phones. Um, I encourage you to read your bulletin or check our website, uulakecounty.org, for the many activities going on each week. New things are added and times and locations change. So each week's bulletin and the website are your best sources for information. If you're interested in learning more about UU and UUCLC, consider signing up for our next orientation class on the sheet in the narthex. Uh, next Sunday, our speaker will be Reverend Janet Ani, who will speak to us on living to delight the holy peace, in the, to delight in the holy peace. The 930 discussion group will be led by Barbara Hill about the sixth principle entitled UU and U2. I have an announcement for uh, a fundraiser in Eustis for the Love Extension on May the 12th. Doors open at 5.30 p.m. It's a jukebox bingo night and begins at 6.30 p.m. at the Eustis Community Center. Tickets are $20. Also, there's a gun safety rally, a peaceful protest organized by Leesburg High School students um, May 27th, 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. in the Leesburg City Hall. Are there any other announcements on the floor? <laughs> no. Okay. Anyone? Okay. Um, okay, I'd like to now invite uh, Al Swinder to share his thoughts with us about our fiscal year 2024 pledge drive, which is currently underway. Good morning. <clears throat> uh, the leader, uh, our treasurer, uh, Chris Higgins, is out of town today. She's in North Carolina. Uh, but she sent me uh, an email that had some data about how we're doing on the pledge drive. <clears throat> this past week, we got $3,640 in new pledges. Uh, which brings our total to $49,604. She said about half the people that are members have made a pledge so far um, and reminded me to tell you that there's still time for you to pledge if you haven't pledged yet. <clears throat> it ends on May 31st. Um, and for me to encourage you to make a pledge um, you can make a pledge by putting uh, the donate something in the donation box. Uh, you could give your card, and there's envelopes out there as well, to Chris. Uh, you can mail it in to the church. And there's a fourth way. Well, you can email Chris and tell her how much you want to pledge. And there's a flyer out there on the table that talks about the church's plans for the coming year, which will give you a good feel for how the congregation will be spending the money. Uh, the second thing I'm supposed to do <clears throat> is to uh, tell you uh, why I made a pledge. Uh, oops. And I, for me, the answer to the question of why I pledged is in the hymn book. And it's hymn number 346. It says, come sing a song with me. Now, I'm not gonna sing it for you, but the chorus in the chorus, which re, same chorus repeats four times in the song. And it says, 
I'll bring you hope when hope is hard to find. And th that's why I made a pledge, because UUC brings me hope. It mitigates cable news, and the, we already heard an announcement about a protest on guns. All the things going on in the world, and I personally can't do too much to help, uh, but I can support the congregation and their efforts. And I gave you, uh, let me give you an idea of some of the things. Is this a mic? Uh, am I on video? Uh, so some of the things that give me hope um, is the members. You give me hope, your positive outlook and kind of a similar way of thinking about things and philosophies that match mine. And if you look at the committees that the church has, they cover lots of different areas from the environment to um, women's health care, gun violence, things that are issues in society as whole, as well as in our community. Uh, they give me hope. Sermons, they send me home thinking about things, in positive ways, ways I can prove myself, ways I can contribute um, my time and whatever talents I might have. And I, th I think the church is a force for good. The UU World, which is the magazine that they publish, there's uplifting things in there that end up giving me hope when I read through that. Uh, the seven principles. Um, that was one of the things that first attracted me quite a while ago to UUC, it was the seven principles. The UUA has a website with lots of information as well as our own website. Uh, UU Southern Region has a website. And the UUA also runs a bookstore where you can buy books related to the UU and their belief. So if you haven't encouraged, if you haven't uh, pledged yet, I encourage you to do that. The pledge drive ends on the 31st and we still have a long ways to go. Thank you. Thank you, Al. <clears throat> Am I all set here? Okay. So welcome to everyone who is here with us today in the sanctuary. And Dustin, can we greet those on Zoom? So uh, if you're a first time visitor, or perhaps returning after an absence, or and if you feel comfortable doing so, I invite you to raise your hand, and when the mic reaches you, tell us who you are and where you're from, and what brought you here today. Do we have any people? Yeah? Anyone? <laughs> Anyone? There we go. Wonderful. Hi. Good morning. Wonderful. Thank you. Welcome. Welcome. <clears throat> we uh, gratefully acknowledge the traditional lands of the Timucua native peoples upon whose ancestral homeland we gather today. We are blessed with this land and we pledge to care for it as our Mother Earth cares for us and for all living things. All are welcome here this morning. Thank you for sharing your Sunday morning with us. <clears throat> 20th century American modernist artist, Georgia O'Keeffe, known in part for her paintings of enlarged flowers said, nobody sees a flower really, it is so small. We haven't time and to see takes time, like to have a friend takes time. Well, 
We gather this hour as people of faith with joys and sorrows, gifts and needs. We light this beacon of hope, a sign of our quest for truth and meaning in celebration of the life we share together. for those who wish to offer a joy, concern, or sorrow, or to set an intention for the coming days. If you'd like to take part in our stone ritual, I invite you now to come in silence to place a stone or stones in the sand at either of the two stations, and one in the front and one in the back. Following this time, anyone who has a joy, concern, or intention that you wish to share aloud with the congregation Please raise your hand and someone will bring the mic to you. If there is anyone um, uh, who would like to um, share aloud with the congregation, please raise your hand. Yes. Good morning. As um, the chairman of the Care and Concerns Committee, I'm going to be giving you a couple of things. I think most of you have received the monthly bulletin, and it tells you 
of the loss of one of our important members that we all love. Um, some of you that have not had a chance to read it yet, it's with sadness that we tell you that Ernie Rossi passed away this week. Um, his wife, Jenna, and I have spoken, and there will be arrangements in a couple of months at where they live at the clubhouse for memorial service. Um, she, she would appreciate cards and calls, I think. Her son's here this weekend with her. But um, she's obviously lonely and feels, you know, sad, of course. So keep Jenna in your thoughts and prayers. And also Kristen is home. Kristen Hughes is home, as most of you probably have heard. But keep him in your thoughts and prayers as he's still healing. And it's so nice to see Judith Haynes over there. She's back with us. <laughs> so thank you for coming back. Judy, you. Yeah. <laughs> um, so those are the things, but especially keep uh, Jenna and the family in their prayers. He has two children, I think he, she said, that are not here at this time, but they'll be coming down for the service. Thank you. Thank you. Is there someone else over here? Oh, yeah. I had a very dear friend who had just departed this week. Um, it was interesting, I used to play the piano over at Waterman and she said, oh, I want to take piano lessons. So she came over and started taking from me and um, her husband had had a stroke and she said, but I want to uh, move somewhere. And I said, oh, well that house right next door to me is for sale. Oh, we're gonna buy that, okay. <laughs> okay, so she, she ended up buying the house and so I gave her piano lessons for quite some time, and she became a wonderful neighbor and a, a friend as well. And um, I, um, um, uh, she ended up having a stroke on the Viking cruise. You know, she landed in Amsterdam and had the stroke getting off the ship, and ended up being in the hospital uh, in Amsterdam for three weeks. And then she arrived back here in the states, you know, via ambulance and plane and whatnot. And, so, um, and then she was in and out of um, assisted living and all of that at that time. But um, she was really a fighter. She hung on for a very long time considering she also had a stroke after her husband had a stroke. And so uh, she was a very brave person. And, and I'm going to miss her a lot. Her name is Enid. And then, is there someone else? There's someone else over here? There's two people. Okay. Ladies first. <laughs> my name is Lynn. And my husband Robert and I have been gone for six weeks because he's been in acute pain. He's in a pain in pain right now. And um, it's kind of a botched knee surgery and um, we're glad to be back. <clears throat> um, my name is Russ Littlefield and um, <clears throat> I have a joy this morning is, as I drove in here, I realized how beautiful our landscaping is around this building, around this beautiful building, and I saw a piloted woodpecker flying right beside the building um, and displaying just beautifully. Um, we have some great wildlife around here. It's part of our reverence for nature. Beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> Are there anyone, is anyone else? Okay, thank you all. If there is anyone who has not been mentioned that you hold concern for, please feel free to name them aloud at this time. Those attending by Zoom may unmute briefly. We will now enter into a time of silent meditation, being mindful of the joys and concerns that we have heard. Take a moment to find a comfortable posture and let the chime draw you into mindfulness. 
Terry's lovely music will then bring us back. Please join me in reaffirming who we are by reciting together our congregational covenant found on the screen. Love is the spirit of this church, and through service, we live our principles. It's our great covenant to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love, and to help one another. It is our tradition at UUCLC to give generously to our church, keeping in mind both its meaning in our lives and its impact on the world. There are several ways to donate listed on the screen, or you can leave your donation in the wooden box in the narthex just outside the sanctuary door. Thank you for your donation today. Solway, written by Lupita Nyong'o, illustrated by Vashti Harrison. Solway was born the color of midnight. She looked nothing like her family, not even a little, not even at all. Mama was the color of dawn, Baba the color of dusk, and Mish, her sister, was the color of high noon. Hardly anyone at school looked like Solway either. People gave her sister Mish pet names like Sunshine, Ray, and Beauty. People gave Solway names like Blackie, Darkie, and Night. Solway felt hurt every time. So she hid away while her sister made lots of friends. Solway dreamed of being the same color as her sister. She wanted real friends too. So she got the biggest eraser she could find and tried to rub off a layer or two of her darkness. That hurt. She crept into Mama's room and helped herself to her makeup. Oh no, she would hear about this from Mama. Solway decided to work from the inside out and only ate the lightest, brightest foods. With a stomach ache, she went to bed early and turned to God for a miracle. Dear Lord, why do I look like midnight when my mother looks like dawn? Please make me as fair as the parents I'm from. I want to be beautiful not just to pretend. I want to have daylight, I want to have friends. If you hear me, my lord, and would like to comply, may I wake up as bright as the sun in the sky. Amen. When Mama came in to wake her for school the next morning, Solway rose to find not a trace of daylight in her midnight skin. Solway told Mama everything. Mama asked, What is your name? Solway, she muttered. And what does it mean? Star, Solway whispered. Brightness is not in your skin, my love. Brightness is just who you are. As for beauty, Mama said, rubbing Solway's stomach the way she always did to comfort her. You are beautiful. Solway sighed. Well, you are beautiful to me, but you can't rely on what you look at to make you feel beautiful, my sweet. Real beauty comes from your mind and how your heart. It begins with how you see yourself, not how others see you. Now up you get and out you go. How could she, as dark as she was, have brightness in her? 
how could she have beauty when no one but her mother seemed to see it? How could she be a star? That night, a shooting star appeared in Solway's window. The night sent me, the star said, come with me. Solway hopped onto the star and off they went. Long ago, at the beginning of time, said the star, there was night and day, and they were sisters. They loved each other very much. But people didn't treat the sisters the same. Lovely, nice, pretty. People gave day pet names like lovely and nice and pretty. People gave night names like scary and bad and ugly. She felt hurt every time. Well, night got fed up and walked right off the earth. Day stayed behind and enjoyed making everybody happy in the sun. But then Day grew too long. Day began to really miss her sister. So did everybody else. There had to be a way to get her back. Day set off to find Night. And she did. I miss you, said Day. I miss you too, said Night. But you don't know what it's like to be treated badly for being dark. You're right, I don't, Day replied. But what I do know is that we need you just the way you are. Come and see. Night returned and the people rejoiced. We need the darkest night to get the deepest rest. We need you so we can grow and dream and keep our secrets to ourselves. The stars chimed in. Brightness isn't just for daylight. Light comes in all colors, and some light can only be seen in the dark. While day had a golden glow, with night everything had a silver sheen, elegant and fine. Day told her sister, When you are darkest is when you are most beautiful. It's when you, you are most you. Could it be that night did not need to change? Not even a little? Not even at all? Now that night and day were back together, a little bit of night returned to day in the form of shadows, and a little bit of day returned to night in the form of moonlight. They were inseparable from that moment on, and promised to celebrate the brightness in each other, whether people chose to see it or not. You see, the star explained, we need them both on their sunniest day and their darkest night, and every shade in between. Together they make the world we know, light and dark, strong and beautiful. Solway rose the next morning beaming. There would be no hiding anymore. She belonged out in the world, dark and beautiful, bright and strong. And if she ever needed a reminder of her brightness, she could look up at the sky on the darkest night to see for herself. Solway felt beautiful inside and out. Author's note. Much like Solway, I got teased and taunted about my night-shaded skin. I prayed to God that I would wake up with paler skin. I tried all sorts of things to lighten my complexion. My mother told me often that I was beautiful. But she's my mother. Of course she's supposed to think that. It wasn't until I was much older that my feelings about my skin changed. It helped to see darker-skinned women being celebrated for their beauty. If they were beautiful, I could be too. I began to see myself differently. While both Solway and I had to learn to see our beauty, I hope that more and more children begin their lives knowing that they are beautiful, that they can look to the beauty in the world and know they are part of it. And yet, what is on the outside is only part of being beautiful. Yes, it is important to feel good about yourself when you look in the mirror, but what is even more important is working on being beautiful inside. That means being kind to yourself and to others. That is the beauty that truly shines through. The journey I went on was very different from Solway's nighttime adventure, but the lesson was the same. There is so much beauty in the world and inside you that others are not awake to. Don't wait for anyone to tell you what is beautiful. Know that you are beautiful because you choose to be. Know that you always were 
and always can be. Treasure it and let the light the way in everything you do. So let's uh, sing together uh, hymn number 38, Morning Has Broken. When you get your neck. Let's not. Let's not and say we did. <laughs> there we go. Okay. <laughs> Nyango, the author of the children's book Solway that we heard earlier, was named the most beautiful woman by People magazine and was named the new face of Lancome, making her the first black woman to appear on the brand. Later that, that November, she was named Woman of the Year by Glamour. But Nyango drew on her own childhood experiences to write the book. In her childhood, she received the message that she was too dark to be beautiful. In her book, Pride Against Prejudice, Transforming Attitudes to Disability, Jenny Morris writes, I was riding the subway one day when this woman came up to me, sat down by me and said, oh my God, it's such a shame, such a pretty girl such ugly hands. My hands and feet are deformed by syndactylism. So I said to her, so would it be better if I were all ugly? Can Jenny Morris not possibly be beautiful? In a longer quote from the same book, Morris writes, the assumptions about us are that we feel ugly, inadequate, and ashamed of our disability that we crave to be normal and whole, that nothing can be gained from the experience, that whatever we choose to do or think is done as therapy to take our mind off our condition, that we are naive and lead sheltered lives, that we need taking out of ourselves with diversions and rewards that only the normal world can provide that we pursue an interest because it is a challenge through which we can prove ourselves capable, that we feel our condition is an unjust punishment, that our disability has made us bitter and neurotic, that we can never give up hope of a cure, that we are asexual or sexually inadequate, 
that any able-bodied person who marries us must have done so for a suspicious motive and never through love, that if we have a partner who is also disabled, we chose each other for no other reason, that if our relationship fails, it is entirely due to our disability, that if we are gifted, successful, or attractive before the onset of disability, our fate is infinitely more tragic than if we were none of these things. So no person with a disability can be attractive, can be beautiful, but perhaps ideas are changing. This week, Mattel announced a new Barbie doll, one with Down syndrome. Wyatt Grantham Phillips reported for the Associated Press that Barbie's new doll representing a person with Down syndrome is part of Mattel's 2023 Fashionistas line, which is aimed at increasing diversi diversity and inclusivity. Previous dolls that have been introduced to the Fashionistas line included Ken doll with a prosthetic leg, a Barbie with hearing aids, and dolls with a skin condition called vitiligo. As a child, I thought I couldn't be beautiful because we had to shop for my clothes in the chubby department. But recently I went to a store and there in a large display above the women's department was a picture of a large size model looking confident and beautiful in a two piece bathing suit. I heard an interview on NPR this week with the author and illustrator Vachi ha Vashti Harrison about her new children's book, Big. It has a picture of a big little girl in a pink tutu on the cover. Harrison starts with the girl as a baby. For quite a while, you're so big is a compliment, until it isn't. In the book, the child eventually reclaims the word big and embraces it. In 2004, a soap company commissioned a study on what women thought about beauty. The study was conducted through a phone survey and interviewed 3,200 women, ages 18 to 64, across 10 countries. Following the study, they found that only 2% of women call themselves beautiful. 72% find their beauty average. 68% strongly agree that the media and advertising set an unrealistic standard of beauty that most women can't ever achieve. 75% wish that the media did a better job portraying women of diverse physical attractiveness, shape, and size. The company has had some missteps but their real beauty campaign has gone viral and people really are considering whether our conception of beauty is too narrow. That company commissioned a study of women, but can men not be beautiful? Again, society has been telling us no. Men can be ruggedly handsome, comments about Pretty boys are usually followed by some comments such as that they should have been a girl. Beauty is apparently gendered, or I might hope it is past tense, has been gendered. I don't think one has to wear certain things to be beautiful, but men are more restricted by society than women. If I come into a congregational event wearing a fedora, vest, and tie, people may give me compliments on my outfit. If one of you who identifies as male comes to a congregational event wearing some makeup, some ruffles, and lace, you are more likely to get sideways glances than compliments. It's hardly fair. Can we not all wear whatever makes us feel beautiful? And for those who identify as genderqueer, 
I'm old enough to remember the long running Saturday night skits of Pat. I did not recognize them as painfully biased then, but Joey Soloway, the non-binary and gender non-conforming creator, producer, and director of the Amazon original series, Transparent, said they felt the premise and character were painful to non-binary and transgender people. Can one not be gender queer and beautiful? The Unitarian Universalist Flower Communion that we will celebrate today honors every person's beauty. The ceremony is 100 years old this year. Unitarian Universalist ministers Deva, David and Teresa Schwartz have written a brief history of its creator, the Reverend Norbert Chopik. His mother was a devout Catholic, his father agnostic, he became an acolyte at age 10 in 1890 at St. Martin's Catholic Church. In the years that followed, he became disillusioned. His priest was a cynic. At 18, apprentice to an uncle, a successful tailor in Vienna, Norbert discovered the Baptists and became a minister. He founded almost a dozen churches from Ukraine to Budapest. Yet slowly, his faith became more and more liberal. He left Bohemia under government threat and accepted a call to serve a Baptist church in New York City until one day in 1919. That day he wrote in his diary, I cannot be a Baptist anymore, even in compromise. The fire of new desires, new worlds is burning inside me. Norbert and his wife, Maya Chopek, joined a Unitarian church in New Jersey in 1921. For the same reason, a whole lot of Unitarian Universalists did. Their children liked the religious education program. World War I ended. His home country now independent, he as Maya returned home to Czechoslovakia. His Unitarian Church was the Prague Liberal Religious Fellowship. In just 20 years, his church had 3,200 members. The traditional Christian communion service of bread and wine wouldn't meet the needs of his congregation because his church, like ours, had people who believed different things. Chopek turned to the beauty of the countryside to the beauty of flowers. In 1923, he developed the flower ceremony. He asked his congregants to bring a flower to church from their gardens, the field, or the roadside. He invited each person to place their flower in a vase. There was the church community represented, no less unique for being united. Following the service, each person could take a flower from the vase, a different one than they had brought. Chopek was a visionary minister with a church ahead of its time, a bold church, a church thinking beyond its doors, beyond what it thought possible. It was a church that was willing to take risks, to make tough decisions, to bear disappointment, and to build a new way, first by building a church and that church could build up the world. That is our church. That was Chopek's church. For this, the Gestapo arrested him in 1942. The Nazis accused Chopek of listening to foreign broadcasts and sent him to the Dachau concentration camp. Even in starvation and torture, he held a flower ceremony with his fellow prisoners finding whatever flowers they could among the weeds of the camp. They testified to a beauty larger than themselves and a love that would outlive them. The Nazis killed Norbert Chopek, but his spirit, courage, and commitment, his beauty, if you will, live on today. Those qualities have passed now to us 
to make them real. His wife, Maya, brought the flower ceremony to the Unitarian Church in Cambridge, Massachusetts in 1940. What we are about to do is not a historical reenactment of something over and done, but an affirmation of our continuity with the generations of struggle, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> with the generations of struggle for ever widening liberty. This flower ceremony, lovely though it is, isn't a diversion from ugly reality, but a gentle fierceness which proclaims that in the midst of sinister days, there is always the light of beauty. We are here to recall not something that happened, but remember something that is happening, to remember, to put it back together again. And in that remembering, may we put ourselves back together again, each as a part of the body of this beautiful community, out of many, one. Today, we celebrate this ritual of solemnity and joy. As Chopik asked his people to bring a flower and celebrate beauty, so shall we. We celebrate the beauty of ourselves. We celebrate the beauty of each other. We celebrate the beauty of our congregation. We celebrate the beauty of our world. Society may try to blind us to that beauty, but it is our work to see beauty everywhere, even as Chopek and his fellow prisoners did. May we too testify to a beauty larger than ourselves and to a love that will outlive us. As Reverend Kimberly Tomchak Carlson says, May we savor the beauty of our abundance and diversity, always cherishing one another. This time, I invite you to come forward and take a flower different from the one you brought, symbolizing the sharing of our beauty, gifts, and brightness with one another. If you cannot come forward, please indicate to an usher that you wish them to bring a flower to you. If you are with us via Zoom this morning, you might virtually both offer and claim a flower in the chat.
Now we can sing together hymn number 1007. There's a river flowing in my soul. century African-American poet, author, and teacher, Gwendolyn Brooks wrote, but dandelions were what she chiefly saw, yellow jewels for every day studying the patched green dress of her backyard. She liked their demure prettiness second to their everydayness, for in that latter quality, she thought she saw a picture of herself and it was comforting to find that what was common could also be a flower. <clears throat> we extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. Together we will sing our parting hymn, Weave. You can hold hands, or if you prefer to just hold hands in the air and send energy to your neighbors, you like to stand up, everyone. And then afterwards, please join us uh, in the uh, social hall for our potluck. Thank you all. <laughs> we got through it. Yeah. Okay.